I've already hinted at the fact that I'm not in mining, so when I sat down for breakfast this morning, I'm a name tag, uh, uh, lur uh, what's the word, lurker, a look at name tags. And I sat down at the table for breakfast this morning, and this gentleman was sitting next to me, and I'm like, why do I know that name? And as MC, I've got to go through my script, and I've got to make sure I figure out what I'm going to be doing, and this name was kind of top center right after the break today. Uh, and it is the gentleman that we're about to hear from. And I've decided that as little that I know about mining, that he's probably, you remember the, the most interesting man in the world? The, the guy who sells the Cuervo tequila or whatever it is? I think that this individual is probably the most interesting man in mining. <laughs> Maybe I'm biased. Maybe I just don't know. But I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Royce Lack. I'm sure that all, uh, all of you know who he is. With over 40 years of mine contracting, consulting, and business management experience, Royce Lack is an independent board member of Torex Gold Resources and Cementation Americas. He is founder of the Cementation Americas as, and was president from its inception in 1998 until 2018. From 2019 to 2020, Mr. Slack, it said Slack, it just said Slack, and I thought, no, Mr., wouldn't you agree? Mr. Slack served as the president of the Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy, and Petroleum, CIM. He has also been active in numerous safety initiatives over the, over the past years as a board, past board member of the Ontario Mine Constructors, Construct, Contractors Safety Association. Say that six times fast. The Mines Accident Safety and Health Association and the Workplace Safety North Mining Advisory Committee. He was also a member of the inaugural Prevention Council for Workplace Safety in the province of Alberta and is past chair and currently on the executive of the CIM Health and Safety Society. And perhaps another thing that makes him the most interesting man in mining, he is also a member of the Cranky Old Men Drinking Beer Society. <laughs> it's true because he gave me his business card. <laughs> this is what you do when you retire on top of all the other things that you do. So with uh, Sla uh, Mr. Slack, Ro Roy Slack will share safety-related stories from his 40-year career in the mining industry that illustrate the Canadian mine safety journey and emphasize the importance of culture. I need a great big welcome for Mr. Roy Slack. <laughs> And it's so great to be here, but I, I was inspired by Dr. Ramit's uh, talk this morning. And so I'm going to share something very personal with you, is uh, the beatings at home have to stop. <laughs> if you're a Leafs fan, <laughs> you know, this is Syria. This is, this is mental health. If you're a Leafs fan, You'll know what I'm talking about. I, I want to see the Leafs win the cup again, this time in color. <laughs> so that may give you an idea about my, about my age. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about safety shares. I'm going to give you a number of safety shares. And these are personal experiences of mine over the last 45 years uh, in this industry. I'm not going to mention names. And I'm not going to mention projects or work sites or companies. It's a no name. It's a generic presentation, so to speak. What I am going to do is share with you either lessons learned or uh, things to think about or ideas. There's lots of opinions in this, so, so bear with me. 40 years of health and safety shares. And I've shared some of these in the past. The ones I've shared before, I'm going to give a little background on. Some of them are I've never shared before, unshared safety shares until now. And one of the things about leadership is storytelling. You need to be able to do that no matter who you're leading, whether it's a crew, a shift, a company. You need to be able to tell stories. And safety shares are just that. It's storytelling. So I have a few of my own guidelines, and you'll see these throughout, but I put them on the screen for you. And first of all, I like to talk in the first-person narrative. And what I mean by that 
is a safety share. I was there. It happened to me. I was part of it. So I can tell it as a story. The other benefit of that is I don't need notes to tell it, but that's another story on storytelling. People can relate to it, and I really believe that most of you will relate to the stories I'm going to tell today. You're in our industry, but they are general. They go beyond the industry. They're genuine. They happened. They've not been. Uh, they've they've not been. Uh, what do I say? Uh, embellished, fabricated. Although there is a story about fabrication. But it's not a fabricated story. Sorry, I, sometimes I digress a bit, but that was a good point. Uh, once you have a story, you want it to reinforce a message because you want it to end up in a call for action. Otherwise, it's just a story. So safety shares are a call to action. And hopefully a few of these are memorable. They've been memorable to me because through the career, these are the ones that I put down. So the first one, and it's interesting because Mike was up earlier and when he went through the risk reviews, he talked about equipment and people as being the number one risk now. I think that's, that's the right. Thing. And this is my first share. My first job underground as a student, and my, my supervisor said to me, he said, just because you can see the operator doesn't mean the operator can see you. Be seen. So I registered that, and I thought about that, and that made sense to me. My second summer, I operated a scoop. And that's when I really understood how little the operator can see. One thing being told, it was the other thing to do. My third summer was at an open pit in British Columbia. And I was mentioning, as an aside, my supervisor asked where I was from, and I said Ontario. He said the only good thing to come out of the east is the sun. <laughs> that's not a safety share. That's just something I remember my supervisor saying. But my third summer, I operated one of the big pit trucks. Even less visibility. visibility. So here, here's an idea for you. In your orientation, when you tell new employees about the visibility that operators have, why not let them sit in the cab, sit behind the wheel? Then they can really see. Because I know for me, it didn't dawn on me until I got behind the wheel just how poor the visibility is. So there's an idea, something you can think about in your orientations. We were roping up, uh, we're putting rope guides in a shaft. And you'll see a number of these safety shares are about shafts, but they apply to uh, a, a number of things in our industry. We had, as you can see from the sketch, uh, there was a rope reel that went around a floating shiv and went up onto the kopi hoist. So what we were doing is we were rope, wrapping the rope guide onto the kopi hoist, and then we were going to lower it down the shaft. And uh, the rope reel was a standard rope reel. The uh, floating rope drum was an empty rope reel. We'd put a piece of pipe through to act as a shaft, and we'd taken chain and we'd welded it to the floor, the, the steel uh, floor in the collar house. So when the rope went under it, it lifted it and it became a floating shiv. Now, I was standing beside it because you can see from the sketch, I could look up to see if the rope wasn't fouling anything in the head frame. And I could also look over to see it being played off of the rope reel. And I had a walkie-talkie. And I was talking to the hoist operator. So when the chains broke, the floating drum came over and pinned me against the wall. And I still remember this. I calmly called the hoist operator, and I just said, stop the hoist. And I, I was probably in shock, which is why I didn't panic. Okay. So lots of lessons learned here. Here's a few of them. Uh, keep inexperienced people out of harm's way. If there's people that don't have a lot of experience, look out for them. Watch for them. See where they stand. 
it's part of our jobs as experienced people, as supervisors, uh, to watch out for young people that don't have the experience we do. I was in the wrong place. I should never have been there. Don't weld chain. A lot of people know that. I didn't know that at the time. If you're welding chain to things, don't do it, especially if there's any force involved. And if there's a setup that has stored energy, and we talk about stored energy in hazard op, in has ops, but if there's a setup that has stored energy, it should be engineered. This setup was jerry-rigged. A few of us figured out, let's do this, it'll work. Didn't work. Wasn't engineered properly. If there's a setup that has stored energy, have it engineered properly. My first shaft project and my supervisor said, don't drop anything down the shaft. You might hit one of my good shaftmen. <laughs> then he walked away. Then as an afterthought, he did, he came, he came back. He said, don't fall down the shaft because you might hit one of my good shaftmen. So I remember that story. Uh, Leo Burnett is a famous New York marketing guy, uh, but, but I thought this was an interesting quote. This was a safety share, very simple, memorable, funny, and in our business of shaft sinking, very important. Don't drop anything down the shaft, ever. A more serious note, uh, we had a fatality. And uh, after the fatality, I, I was in the, the bunkhouse and I was in the lunchroom. And one of the old timers, and uh, it, it's kind of depressing to say not as old as I am now, but he seemed really old at the time. One of the old timers said to me, we lose one about every thousand feet. And I thought that was an outrageous statement. Uh, but on that project, we had three fatalities. And that statement talked about the culture that we had at the face. And I'm going to talk about that a bit. It was a culture of inevitability. Someone was going to get hurt. Someone was going to get killed. Hope it's not me. Yeah. Hope's not a plan. We know that. But that was the culture. Lots of people in the industry had already recognized that this was an issue. And focus began, focus which started as compliance. Here's the rules, you have to follow them. And we recognized that wasn't enough. Because without the culture, people wouldn't always follow the rules. We were already starting to gravitate from an industry of compliance to one of commitment. A very important shift in our culture. But this was at a time when the industry was just looking at compliance, doing what we had to do to get by, and it wasn't working. The culture at the face, at the shop, at the workplace, wherever the work is being done, that's your safety culture. It's not what me as the president or the CEO tells you. It's not what the posters on the wall say. It is what the workforce at the face sees and feels. That is your safety culture. And you need to be in tune to it. And, and I feel that's a fact. Now, here's an opinion, because there's lots of talk about zero harm. But my own feeling is, if you don't believe in zero harm, if your organization does not promote zero harm, if you're not committed to zero harm, then you have a culture of inevitability. Someone's going to get hurt at some point in time, and it'll be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Opinion. Another shaft project, and I was in the collar, and they rang up from down below, and the leader said, we're not going to make the blast. They had to make the blast, supposed to make the blast, got to make the blast, weren't going to make the blast. So I had to 
tell the shaft super. And I know I was going to get a blast, not the right blast. Because he, he was an ornery guy at the best of times. He was in a bad mood that day. Uh, I called him and told him. And I could see him run out of the trailer and run towards the shaft. Got to the collar. The crew was 3,000 feet down drilling. He was at the top of the collar. And I learned some swear words I had never heard before. <laughs> he cursed that crew down at the collar. Of course, they couldn't hear him. They were down there drilling. Then all of a sudden, he stopped, and he went back to his office. At the end of the shift, the leader came up and said to me, you'd never believe what I found on the blasting set. False teeth. <laughs> He'd lost his upper plate. So I would tell this story to our shaft crews. And of course, remember in the storytelling, I said, you need to have a moral. And of course, the moral is never drop anything down the shaft, not even your false teeth. So imagine my surprise when I did a site visit and I look up on the wall, and this poster, oh, I'm pointing to it, this poster is on the wall at one of our projects. And if you read through it, it's don't drop anything down the shaft, hard hat, safety glasses, wrench, plumb bobs, false teeth, anything. Now, that was kind of special for me. Someone had actually heard my story and remembered it, uh, so that was kind of special. But another idea, if you have a great story, and there's, there's so many great stories in our industry, and you can attach a moral to it, use it, pay it forward, tell that story. Because those are memorable. Those are things people will remember. How many people, I can't see anyone because of the lights, but how many people have worked in the Alamac race? Okay. Uh, if you've worked in the Alamac race, you probably haven't worked in a knuckleback race. And I'm not sure if anyone has. I hope you haven't. Uh, typically what happens when we drive a race is the rail is on the hanging wall. And the climber drives the race, and the crew excavate. When we are dumping ore or waste from a level, often we'll have a finger raise, which the muck goes from that finger raise into the raise. So you can see the picture is there's a dumping point up above, a finger raise, probably more of an angle than it's shown there. So what someone decided to do uh, is, instead of doing this as an open raise or a cribbed raise or a drop raise, let's just put the rail on the foot wall and just keep driving the Alamac up. Uh, that was a bad idea. And I was in the raise with a student, and we were going up the raise. We ran around the curve, and we're at the face. The, the Alamac, the way it's set up, is the, the platform is set up at the angle for the raise you're driving. So when you go around that corner, all of a sudden, nothing is set up right. And I went to open the door to get out of the cage. And when I opened the door, the door came back down and severed my thumb. So I wrapped it up, and I went back down the raise. Lessons learned. Uh, <laughs> I probably should have used different wording here. But I should never have been in that Alamac. Or let me rephrase that. I've been up to raise lots, but I'm not a raise miner. I'm not trained to operate that piece of equipment. And to send me up there on my own with a student, no less, was wrong. And I should have said something. I should have spoke up and said, I shouldn't be going up there. I need uh, a leader. I need an Almac miner to come with me. Second thing, we developed the methodology again without any kind of hazard analysis to see what was going to happen when things changed. That all that equipment was designed to go up a raise at that angle. As soon as you turn all that equipment this way, everything changes. And you can't change 
uh, people that know Alamac know that the, uh, the, the support arms are a certain length so that the platform is at a certain angle when you're driving the rays. Now to go around that curve, you would have probably had to change those arms, which you couldn't do in mid-rays. Anyway, I'm getting into too much detail. The, the, the main thing is that we changed, significantly changed a methodology without doing the proper hazard analysis and, and a, a clueless young engineer was hurt in the process. I sold my chainsaw. I wasn't that attached to it, uh, but it was a nice, I thought it was a nice one. It said pro right on the blade. So I figured it had to be pretty good. I don't know who this guy Poulin was, but, but the reality was I used it once or twice a year. I didn't have the protective equipment. I should have. I didn't take a course. I'm not sure if WSN still does the course. I could have taken the course from an excellent provider of that training, Workplace Safety North. But the reality was, even if I bought the equipment, and even if I took the course, I only used it once or twice a year. What would happen next year when I used it? It would be like starting all over again. And I got thinking about training and how we do that. And, and uh, so here's something to think about. If you're training people once a year, if you're training people once a career, which is common core, right? If you're training people once for something they do rarely, are they really trained? Okay, something to think about. <clears throat> Another shaft project, and we were in a, a station, and the stations are always tricky, the, the brow, uh, because uh, between, the, between the blasting, the change in ground, structure, there's a number of things at play. But this station was pretty good ground. Not, not the one in the picture, but the station was pretty good ground and it had been supported into the last blast. Night shift had blasted. Our day shift supervisor told everyone, nobody's going in there until I take a look. <clears throat> and he was very safety conscious. And, he went down there, he took a look, he was under unsupported ground for about three seconds and it came down on him and crippled him for life. Unsupported is unforgiving. And it doesn't matter whether it's a few seconds or a few minutes, any exposure to unsupported ground is too much. In my introduction, it was mentioned that I am a member of Cranky Old Men Drinking Beer. This, this has nothing to do with that. That was a shameless plug, actually. Uh, but this was an incident imaging, or an accident imaging. This is a tool that we were using, and some of you may have used this tool before. Uh, this was a startup contractor. I was running the business, but when you start a business, you're also running the jobs. So I was a night shift supervisor on this job after my day, my day job. The, what we did was each shift, one of the crew members gave what we called an accident imaging. And to, for those of you that aren't familiar with this type of safety share, what you do is you imagine an incident that could happen. You explain the consequences of that action, and then you explain how we can prevent that from happening. Very simple. So a young construction miner, and, and I, I should say the crew is doing an excellent job at this. I saw some really impressive presentations uh, over the course of the project. This young construction miner got up and he said, uh, after six or seven beers, twisting the top off, Consequence, you can cut your hand. Prevention, use a bottle opener. And I looked at his hand and there was a Band-Aid around his finger. And it dawned on me, these aren't imagined instances at all. This accident imaging tool we were using, people were 
talking about things that had happened to them that they hadn't reported or didn't feel were worth reporting. But it's far easier for us to talk about something that happened than to try and imagine something and make something up. This is what was happening with our, our incident imaging. And it brings the question for, for management. If someone presents an imagined incident that may have really happened, what do we do about that? We know what we do when something happens, when something's reported. <clears throat> the other thing I did, because I could see this, <clears throat> this young man was self-conscious, because there really were some pretty fancy presentations, uh, and his was a very simple one. So right after I came up to, I came up to him and I said, you know what, that's a great safety shirt. And I said, I have a few beers every now and then, and from now on, I'm going to use an opener. And, and I do, by the way, but that's a, no, sorry. But the, the point here is positively reinforce as soon as possible safety shares, reporting, the things we want to see. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute, too. <clears throat> this was, uh, I was called as a expert witness at an inquest. And anyone that's been involved in an inquest knows it's not a pleasant experience. Uh, there's, there's lots of emotion. And I was there as an engineer to talk about this. So I'm going to, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about the engineering portion of it. Uh, and those of you familiar with uh, legislation in Ontario, uh, mining industry is one of the industries that if there is a fatality, there is an inquest. Uh, it's a painful process, but it's important because there's lessons learned that we as an industry need to know. Legislation has been changed over the years for the better because of this, of this process. This particular incident it was a raise, a drilled and blasted raise, and the crews were putting a, a ladder way in from the top down. So this was a work stage. It was supported by a cable to a winch up top. And the idea was that this stage would be lowered as each section of the manway was put in, or the ladder way. So the design of the stage, occasionally the stage had to go back up. So the engineers wanted to design it, design it like, like a sleigh runner, okay? So with that curve in it, so it, it could go back up. So you can see the design um, on your left, the larger picture. And this is just the, the base. I haven't shown the whole platform or the structure. So the first design was a welded connection at that runner. And the engineers looked at that and they said, that's a weld intention. It's going to get a lot of work and we need a plan B. So they designed a gusset plate to go around it. And you see the gusset plate with the four bolts. And then you see the design in, in the, uh, I'm getting my directions, on your right at the top was the design. So it was a gusset plate with four bolts that went right through the HSS beam. What you see in the bottom right-hand corner is what was actually fabricated. So you mentioned a fabricated story. This is a fabricated story. Uh, this is what was actually fabricated, two bolts. So when the weld failed, the connection just acted like scissors, came apart, and it actually sliced the bolt. The work stage went down the shaft, and one of the miners was killed. So this is what happened. So there's obviously, there's a lot of lessons learned from this. Uh, I like to avoid welds in tension whenever possible. Uh, in the work we do in shaft sinking, you have a lot of work platforms. Uh, anytime you can design that uh, uh, without that weld in tension, go for it. It's just an engineering comment. Confirm that what is designed is what is built. That's in the act now. And it may have come from, I don't know if it came from this inquest or not, but that was a change to the act. And now a professional engineer or their designate is to confirm that what was designed is what was built. 
The other important thing is that the engineers didn't realize the service that this stage would go through. And they thought only occasionally would it go up. But the reality was in the process, it went up quite often. And every time it went up, it caught on the screen on the footwall. So they would just crank up the winch, and when that came loose from the screen, it would bounce. So there was all kinds of forces at play there that hadn't been designed in. The stage wasn't built as it was designed. It wasn't designed for the service it was provided. It's so important that the engineers that do the design understand how it's being used and see it in the field. Lessons learned. Uh, Dr. Ramit had talked about change. And I remember many years ago, Masha would put out that uh, magazine. I don't know if, who remembers the, the magazine from those days. And the cover, uh, the, the cover article was change management. And that was an epiphany for me. I, I'd seen the light. Change management. Here's where we are now. Here's where we have to get to. Okay? We're hurting people now. We want to get to zero harm. We have a culture of compliance. We want a culture of commitment. We want to make change. What we're doing with safety is all about change. Is getting from safer to safe. Safer isn't good enough. We need to get to safe. So here's a crazy idea for you, is maybe more people who are involved in safety should understand change management. Dr. Ramit had talked about that expectation versus reality. Uh, there's, there's another concept for that called crossing the chasm, which is when innovation is implemented and the early adopters adopt it, but how do you get it mainstream? And that doesn't just apply to technology, that applies to ideas, it applies to culture as well. There's, there's a real step change there that has to happen. And we, leaders have to understand change management, and I think our safety profession does too. I've given this safety share a number of times. I want to give a little bit of background on it before I do it. Uh, we were doing a project Engineering had gone well, the, the site construction had gone well, the head frame was up. First blast on schedule. Everybody happy. I went to site, and during my site visit, I noticed that a number of the safety procedures hadn't been completed yet. The maintenance program on the jumbos wasn't in place. And by that Christmas, we'd had four injuries and we had to pull the jumbos out of the shaft for rebuild. It was around that time that I read this report from NASA about Apollo 1. And you remember the Apollo program to put a person, at that time it was a man, now it's a person on the moon, uh, to put someone on the moon and there was a long program to do it and Apollo 1, the first, uh, the first spaceship, two weeks before blast off in a training exercise, a spark in the module, highly oxygenated module, started a fire, which created an explosion, which killed three astronauts during training. As you can imagine, there was a very detailed incident investigation about these fatalities. And what they determined, they coined a term called go fever. And they, they talked about the, the milestone of doing that blast off on time and sometimes taking risks in order to meet those critical schedule dates. And then in the report, I still remember the terminology they used. They talked about the, the macho go hard or go home attitude of the management and the astronauts. Sound like mining to you? <laughs> it sure sounded like mining to me. And that's when I talk about this gold fever, because I, I saw it on a job site, 
and then I saw it in this report. Use pre-development audits, and in those audits, make sure safety procedures are in place, the maintenance programs are in place, the staffing, the training, all those things that are important to start the project are in place. But more important than that is, and I, I've lived in a project world for most of my career, the owner, the contractor, project management, everyone has to be committed to making sure you don't start until everything you need to do the job safely is in place. And that should be part of your project charter or whatever you do when you start your project, that should be a commitment that everyone makes. And that doesn't take anyone off the hook for meeting schedule. What it means is you have to figure out how to meet schedule with all those things in place. I visited a job site and I look up on the bulletin board and there's all these photos of things gone wrong, like a wall of shame. And then one of our miners came up to me and said, you know, you break 99 rounds to the nuts and nobody says anything, but you blow one out and you get your ass kicked. And I actually cleaned up that a bit. That's <laughs> For the sake, I know it's a sensitive uh, audience here. Uh, so I cleaned that up a bit. But, you know, and I thought about all of the opportunities we missed to reinforce people for things that were being done right. And the systems we had in place were designed to find things that were done wrong and point at people and point out, don't do this again. So my ideas aren't very deep. I, I do have some deep ideas later. I'll get into that later. But this is pretty simple. It's a basic management concept, and we should use it in safety too. Let's watch when people do things right and thank them for it. Positive reinforcement. It's actually very simple to do. But one of the things you have to do is you have to actually think about it. You have to go in with that mindset. Today, on this inspection, I'm going to look for things that are done right. I want to find the 99 things that are done right. And sure, I'm going to point out the one thing that's being done wrong. It's part of my job. But probably more important is to reinforce those positive things you see so that they happen again and again. Mucking out a shaft station with an Emco mucker, that's a, if that machine looks nasty there, uh, it's because it is. I don't know how many people have operated one of those. I was terrible. And uh, they're a very tricky piece of machinery to operate. But we had a very good operator running it. And he saw the loose. There wasn't loose. He saw the face and there was some muck that they were undercutting. So they knew it was going to come down. And he thought he could get away in time. And uh, he couldn't. And it came down, it caught the back of his leg, and he had a very severe laceration, a lot of stitches all along the, the calf area. He was actually lucky it wasn't worse than that. But when we did the investigation, asked him if he had seen the hazard, and he said yes. But he figured he could get out of the way in time. It wasn't his fault. Low air pressure. The machine didn't move as fast as it should have. Anyway, accountability, we'll talk about that in a minute. But when we talked to his partner, who had about two years' experience, we said, did you see the hazard? He said, yes. He said, did you say anything about it? He said, no. He says, my partner's got 25 years' experience. He knows better than I if it's safe or not. When I heard that statement, immediately what I thought about was our safety culture. What kind of safety culture do we have in terms of reporting, in terms of inclusiveness? And we talk a lot about diversity and inclusion. And in our industry, one of the challenges with inclusion is experienced operators and young people. And you've already seen that in a couple of my slides, my experience as a, as a young engineer. But is your workplace a place where young people can speak up? Do experienced people listen? Okay. 
That's what Dr. Moody was talking about, listening. Do your experienced people listen? Uh, or do they respond with sarcasm and ridicule? That was my experience when I first got in the industry. It's changing, which is great to see. But what do your incident investigations tell you about your culture? There's not a section or a box on most investigations to relate to that, but we all know how important it is. So every time you do an incident investigation, I hope you think about what does this incident tell us about our safety culture. I attended a, a safety meeting and the supervisor said, and I, I won't be able to quote him exactly, but you'll get the idea. So you picture, you're the crew, I'm the supervisor. And he goes, listen up. He said, you don't want your best friend and your wife spending your life insurance money. <laughs> now, apart from the mental health implications of that, <laughs> it, it's, it's a comment that I, I thought about. And I, first of all, it, it caught your attention, caught mine. Uh, but, but secondly, I, I think what was happening there is here's a supervisor that knew how to motivate his people. He knew what resonated. He knew what would catch their attention. I was in Africa and attending a project, and there was a safety um, a play, I would call it, a skit, for lack of a better word. And the, the worker was in an area, and this loose came down on him, and he was injured. And he had to go home and tell his son that he got hurt at work. And his son was losing respect for his father. Now, there's a group that knows what motivates their people, and they're using it to get safety ingrained in their culture. I thought that was interesting. What motivates your people? Over the holidays, I was walking down a flight of stairs, and, and I was thinking, what if I fell? You know, I was the one driving the family, the wife and the grandkids. I thought if I fell, that would be a problem. And, you know, it's not like Bruce Willis or Harrison Ford fought. Well, maybe it is today. They're both getting up there in years. May, I should think of a younger action figure. But it's not like in the movies when you fall. You fall, you get hurt. And then I thought about what my injury might be. And then I thought about how to prevent it. Lots of thinking, but I wasn't done there. Then I thought I just did a incident imaging. And then I thought, geez, I'm pretty safety conscious. And then I thought I'm conscious of being safety conscious. Now I could go on and on. It was a lot of, a lot of deep thinking for a mining engineer. Uh, you know, not Plato or anyone, but pretty deep. So here's, here's something that I wonder about. This isn't my last slide, but I'm getting near. Things are getting better. Things are getting a lot better in our industry. If I look 45 years ago, what was happening? I talked about those fatalities in the shaft. Today we do shafts, lost time injury free in our country. Things are getting better. I know for me, one of the things that influenced my safety journey was seeing these horrific conditions and these terrible injuries. Now, hopefully, if we're doing things right, our new workers aren't seeing those anymore. So how do you get our new workers to be safety conscious? Hopefully, they're not getting hurt, so that's not doing it. Hopefully, their coworkers aren't getting seriously injured, that's not doing it. How do we get new people to be safety conscious? That's a, a question. I don't have an answer, something for you to think about. Now, the people in this picture are not part of this story. But this is a group uh, of experienced people and one uh, kind of clueless young engineer. He wasn't that young anymore. Uh, we're standing on what we call the platform or the pancake, whatever you want, in the bucket. 
But when, when I started, it was standard operating procedure to ride the rim. That's how we got down the shaft. We stood on the rim, we held onto the chains, we went down the shaft. And I don't know what date it was when we decided to stop doing that. I'm sure there were fatalities, the hoist kicked out and bounced and people get off. But, but I'll tell you, I remember going down the shaft and nodding off on the way down, leaning against that chain. It's just a boring trip down. It was just standard. But every, every mining contractor I know has procedures that strictly forbid that. You ride now, you ride in the bucket. So I was visiting a job site, and we're going down the shaft. We got into the bucket, and the shaft superintendent was standing on the rim, about to ring the bells to go down. And I didn't, I didn't want to talk to him like this in front of his crew, but I had to. I told him, you need to get into the bucket. He did. And after that, on surface, we had a, we had a chat. And what he told me was, if you want the kind of footage that you're expecting on this project, we're going to have to take a few shortcuts. Uh, that superintendent was very well liked by the client. The client's project manager was personal friends with him. So I left that site, and I went to the client's office, and I said, we have to make a change. And they didn't want to. I said, well, we're going to. And I said, not only that, but your project manager is part of the problem. So we finally made that change. And the project, we stopped people getting hurt, and the project went better. One of our, uh, in one of our safety uh, sessions, this is what one of our miners told me. So this goes back to my comments earlier. Your safety culture is a safety at the face. Not in your office, not the posters, not the speeches. It's the safety at the face. And who drives the safety at the face? The superintendent. Site superintendent is the one who sets the safety culture. This was a comment from one of the miners. But he didn't let me off the hook. He didn't let management off the hook. Because he said, whatever the safety culture is, management's letting it happen. The safety superintendent on site is critical to your safety culture. There's, over the years, when I, and when I did this presentation, I thought back to all the times that I was injured or almost injured and all the things that happened, and I thought about what I was doing or not doing. When all is said and done, with all the systems, with everything in place, we're accountable for our own safety. And we all have to think about that. If you're in a situation that's unsafe, you speak up. There's processes. If people aren't listening, you take the next step. If you're with an employer that's not concerned about safety, quit. Leave before they carry you out. Responsible for your own safety. This safety, uh, this talk is a white paper. Uh, CIM Health and Safety Society has put it together as a white paper. Uh, Samantha Espley is in the room. Samantha is the incoming uh, chair of the CIM Health and Safety Society. It's a great group. If you're a CIM member, join it. If you're not, Join CIM and join it. That's my plug. If you want a copy of this uh, white paper, uh, there's my email address. Feel free to send me a note. And thank you for being here. I'm preaching to the choir, as they say, but thank you for everything you do to keep our people safe. Thank you. How many in this room learned something new in the last hour? Almost everyone. 
I've had the privilege since 2005 of being in the room with Roy on multiple occasions, and every time I learned something new. It, uh, it, it grew me as a health and safety professional, it grew me as a leader, and at one time he shared his book with me, which again, just helped me along. Um, for those of you involved in the mine contracting, I think you'll share with me the amount of effort and time he put into that. Going to a mine contractor safety association meeting was very different for me in 2005, and we showed up there, and I was trying to learn to get to know everybody. But we would see presidents of companies sitting in the room with the workers and the supervisors, and I was blown away at that. Coming from a large company, I'd never seen that. And repeatedly, we'd see them at the meetings providing leadership right to the front line. It amazed me. That group still meets today and is still my favorite meetings to attend are the ones by the OMCSA. If you haven't been, you have an opportunity, I encourage you to do so. But before I go on any further about that, um, we'd like to take a moment, Roy, and uh, recognize the, outst the outstanding lifetime achievement of a true leader in the mining industry, particularly in the area of health and safety. As mentioned earlier, Roy is a professional engineer with over 40 years of experience in the mining industry. In 1998, he started Cementation, a mining contracting company. In 2019, that company was the recipient of the gold winner of Safest Employer in Canada for the natural resource sector. Roy has influenced innovations in mechanized mining and shaft sinking that have increased productivity and decreased construction costs while making the operation safer. He was appointed to the province of Ontario's first prevention council in 2013 to advise the government on a workplace safety, where he served for four years. He's a past president of the Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy and Petroleum, which we refer to as the CIM, and past chair of the CIM Health and Safety Society. He has been active in numerous safety initiatives over the years, including a past board member of Ontario Mining Contractor Safety Association, the Mines Act and Safety and Health Association, and of Workplace Safety North Mining Advisory Committee. In 2018, he was inducted into the Sudbury Area Mining Supply and Service Association Hall of Fame, and in 2019, he was inducted as a lifetime member into the Ontario Mining Contractor Safety Association. He currently serves on the CIM Task Force, Safety Task Force. Roy tirelessly, uh, tires, Roy's tireless efforts have transformed the mining industry's safety culture, improved working conditions, and helped prevent injuries and illnesses. Today, we honor this leader for his remarkable lifetime achievement. achievements. Roy's dedication, passion, and unwavering commitment to health and safety excellence have left an indelible mark on the mining industry and the world at large. We thank him for his invaluable contributions and we look forward to building upon his legacy. Please join me in recognizing Roy Slack on a lifetime of achievement in mining health and safety and wishing him well, all the best in his future endeavors. Thank you. I'm almost speechless. <laughs> I'm feeling, feeling 25 again. Thank you very much.